Conjuring universe have spanned from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and now we're finally getting into the 80s. It's a challenge we give ourselves to make sure that with each film we surpass the ones prior. It's good to get a fresh take on where we can take the Conjuring universe. Ah! I command you to obey me! One of the things that I think is important for all of you to really keep in mind through the work that you currently do, the cosmos does not know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So when you're working on something that has very dark archetypes, like a horror movie, these things can come to life. Uh, these things can be produced by any kind of interaction with these very archetypes, the very things that you guys are creating here. Well, when I made The First Conjuring, I just really wanted that film to be, to stand on its own, you know, to be the best it can be. And really, you know, just wanted to make a film that was very much a throwback to the kind of horror films that I loved growing up. Um, you know, the, the sort of more classic sort of haunted house stories from the 70s and 80s. And so when we were making the movie at the time, it became very apparent that the story about the Warrens um, had many sort of factions to them. The fact that they have investigated so many different cases meant that uh, naturally it would allow us to sort of look into other avenues of storytelling. We really enjoyed the work we were doing and we really never wanted to stop. Tell me about the beginning, the first night of your happening, what was your brother's, brother's plane doing? pulling about? I wasn't quite sure now. It was scary. Yeah. When I think back, I think we helped a lot of people. What was fascinating about this from the beginning, and I remember James selling it to us, was as dark as you get with these stories, there was going to be a real freedom in wanting to show the light and the love. And that purity is just a stark contrast to that yeah. negativity and the darkness that, yeah. that we portray. And yeah. that's what's so appealing. <laughs> we were just sort of playing amongst ourselves in our heads and just sort of joking that it wouldn't be great to, you know, if we get the chance to explore other stories as well within the uh, sort of the world of the Warrens. And then from that, for the success of the first movie, we were allowed to do so. But no, I never expected that the Conjuring sort of universe would go on to be as big as it has become. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we stand before you, Holy Spirit, conscious of our sinfulness, but aware that we gather in your name. Come to us, remain with us, and enlighten our hearts. Do not allow us to be misled by ignorance or corrupted by fear or favor. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The main sort of mothership uh, and by that, I mean the main co Conjuring films. Those ones are the ones that we, you know, try to be more true to the real life stories that they're based on. But with the spin offs and the offshoots, I feel like we can just explore different sub genres in the horror genre. Um, with The Nun, it was really like my love of the classic medieval horror films that we don't really see much anymore, like the kind of horror films that Hammer Horror used to make. I had a series of visions when I was younger. What did you see? I saw none.
As a diehard horror fan since I was a kid, I'm always on the lookout for great horror movies and classic horror movies. And so I was really excited when I read The Nun. It's set in Romania in an abbey. It's almost a world of its own. The Nun comes right before Annabelle Creation. In fact, sister Charlotte in Annabelle Creation references time she spent at an abbey in Romania, and she has a photograph, and that photograph is from the Abbey of St. Carta. That's Sister Maria, that's Sister Anna, and that's Sister Lucia. Who's this? Our film crew journeyed across Romania to tell the very first tale in the Conjuring movie universe. Gothic spires, rugged countryside, and subterranean tunnels met us at every turn. But we were determined to film the nun only as Valak would have it. We knew that Romania was a perfect place to do it, that it had the right look and the right feel. And Gary wrote an incredible screenplay based on a story that he and James broke. It's something I found very exciting because it's, uh, we're, you know, Dracula was set. You know, I mean, it's just this for a horror fan, it's like, you know, uh, Mecca in a lot of ways. It contained elements that I hadn't seen before, actually, in even the Conjuring movies. There's much more of a sense of an adventure at heart of it and an investigation. And by the end of reading that, I thought, I can get my teeth into this. The Abbey has a long history. Valak. Not all good. The Demon Nun. She has a relatively small but pivotal role in Conjuring 2, but she was a character that just resonated with people. They loved Valak, they loved who she was, they loved her unique look. You know, I think we always knew from the very first screening that that was a character that deserved to be spun off and her origin stories told. You know, when I saw her in The Conjuring 2, it was another classic one horror icon. And then when he put her in a castle in Romania, it was, you know, what's not to love? The Defiler, the Profane, the Marquis of Snakes. You know, from a Catholic standpoint, the idea of something that you hold really sacred could be perverted like that is what gives it the strength that it has. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, um, I think that was what worked for movies like The Exorcist as well. I think people are so afraid of religious figures because they install fear in people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. You better be good. You better do this, because I'm closer to the Holy One than you are, and I'm going to deem you down into hell. It's a contradiction to think that someone so devout could be overcome and overrun with this evil. It means anybody can. Religion is scary because it's real, but abstract at the same time. I believe in this duality that we all, you know, great and, and terrifying. We can be fantastic people or we can be horrible people on the same day. We have that. We snap at really easily. And, uh, and there's some, some people can't control their own demons, and that's when tragedies happen. What? Caliban's here. With the Conjuring franchise, they built something so strong and so beautiful, but when you combine all this, well, you just have a good story and a good film. It's been also because of religion that we live the most terrifying stories throughout history. They are connected. An exorcism can be very dangerous. Take Maurice Tierro. His friends called him Frenchy. He was a French-Canadian farmer, nothing more than a third-grade education. Yet after he was possessed, he spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard. Dear heart, you 
disposition turns cold. Mm -hmm. I was already a big fan of The Conjuring. It felt like a very classic horror movie. And I was just really intrigued by that world. <laughs> James just did such a great job with setting her up in that first Conjuring. So now she has this kind of feeling of dread attached to her. People react as soon as she comes up on screen. She is a star. People love Annabelle. I've been to so many screenings, and every time that doll appears on screen, people just shifts, people react, people just love her. And I think that speaks volume to the world that we're trying to create here. What is it about this doll that makes it so haunting and, and evil? Oh my gosh. And that was a question I wanted to answer. I feel a different kind of presence. What kind? An evil one. A lot of people wanted to know where she came from. So the origin story was a natural place to go for us. Samuel and Esther Mullins, couple has a child, B, and they kind of have this idyllic life. And he's a master doll maker, making fairly stunning dolls. And you can tell that something's amiss. Hey, Mark. And then his daughter is killed in an accident. No! We decide we want to do anything to have her back. They didn't care how it was going to happen as long as they got to see their daughter again, whether it was some other demonic entity that was going to allow them to have those moments, they were open to it. We prayed to see our girl again. But then she wanted to move into the doll. We soon realized it wasn't our daughter. <laughs> we thought helping the girls could be our penance. This is our new orphanage. Big as a castle. But we ended up giving it just what it wanted. James Wan, he's like, listen, kids with toys, creepy dolls, seems to fit. What about you know making them orphans? When the orphans move into the house, because of the fragility of Janice, she's really open to a demonic possession. One, two, three. Evil can't be contained. No. Not in this universe. Janice's big mistake was opening the hidden closet where the Mullins hid the Annabelle doll. They have her locked away to sort of contain the evil. But of course, it doesn't really work if you open it up. With these pages from the Bible plastered all over the ceiling and the walls was the father's attempt to contain the demon with the word of God. Wow, that, that's a creepy, that that's must a creepy. be a creepy reveal. <laughs> Even if it wasn't a doll in there, it's just a creepy room. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> she found this doll. What doll? The one in the white dress. She mustn't go near that doll. Annabelle, too, has a very sort of classic period look to it. That's the key to keeping um, this universe feeling fresh and unique. Annabelle creation is an expansion of the first movie and its expansion of this universe. They're all connected to the Conjuring world, but I think it's great for them to be their own films, to be their own sort of subgenre, if you will. They all go together. You know, there is this established timeline. It was a gift from my mom for my birthday. I don't know where she got it, but we are beyond terrified. We always knew that Annabelle, we felt like she had a lot more stories, and so we kind of expanded on that story with Annabelle 1. And uh, I think my love and obsession for creepy dolls, <laughs> it led me to the Warrens. You know, me stumbling across the story of Annabelle led me to dig deeper into who the Warrens were. So all these are taken from cases you've investigated. That's right. The Conjuring films are based on case files that Ed and Lorraine Warren uh, investigated, really kind of grounds these films. It really gives them a sense of realism. It gave us a foundation that was real to begin with. We're back a little too wide. Yeah, we've been too wide, especially. The original idea on The Conjuring was simply to make one great character-driven supernatural thriller, to make the best supernatural thriller that people had seen in a very long time. 
My name is Ed Warren. It's November 1st, 1971. I'm sitting here with Carolyn Perrin, who, with her family, has been experiencing supernatural occurrences. <laughs> Basically, the story is about this young family, the parents, a mom and dad with five daughters. They move into this farmhouse in Rhode Island. And when they first move in, you know, everything's kind of fine and cool. And then they slowly start to realize that they've been haunted by different entities living on this property. There's one particular one that was really malevolent. That's why they ended up calling in the Warrens to help them. Mom and Dad tell me that you have a friend. His name is Rory. He lives here, too. Do you mind if I try to see Rory? When the music stops, you see him in the mirror standing behind you. Look what she made me do. The crucial aspect for me was the real life inspiration of Ed and Lorraine Warren. The conjuring is very, very accurate. When you give recognition, when you go into a place where haunting phenomena is going on, and you give it recognition, you give it energy, and then you can do whatever it wants. What is it? Sometimes, for me, I'll make the signs across, name of Jesus Christ, go away go back to where you're coming from when I get really overpowered. Lorraine saw something. Go ahead, on. You have a lot of spirits in here, but this is the one that I'm most worried about because it is so hateful. When I first met Lorraine, I was actually very nervous. I want to do her justice and basically have a blessing on the film. I, I love this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've got Lorraine's I, blessing now. Lorraine Warren is such a fascinating character, and Ed has passed on now. But with Vera, she actually was fortunate enough to have Lorraine be around to be able to talk to her, to understand who she is, and kind of really know what motivates her to do what she does. Hi, Mama Bear. <laughs> Patrick's version of Ed is a very romanticized version of Ed. Ed was always much more a very practical guy. All right, it's 918. We're headed down into the cellar where the door's just opened on its own. I have Lorraine and Officer Brad Hamilton with me. Being a demonologist is just like being a carpenter. Exercising a demon or a ghost out of a house is no different to fixing a car or a TV set. Doesn't always work when you want it to. Watch out! And Vera Farmiga, her character is psychic. And so she comes at it from a different angle. What I really love about their characters is, even though they approach at it from two very different perspectives, they both have a very similar end goal. When you go into a home where infestation is taking place, you know, where haunting phenomena is taking place, I walk around the rooms in the house. I can tell if it's a human spirit, and I can tell if it's an inhuman spirit, because it's terrifying. And it, sometimes you feel like s some cloud is coming right down, almost taking your breath away. Showing the scares through the Warrens would be nowhere near as scary as if I showed the scares through the perspective of this family, but still staying true to what the family say they experience. That was where I drew a lot of my inspirations from. Nice doll. That's what you think. Our film starts very much the same way that the first Conjuring started, with Ed and Lorraine taking possession of the Annabelle doll, feeling that the evil that is within her can be contained within the artifact room. We think it best the doll come with us. We'll keep it somewhere safe. Annabelle Comes Home is literally what the title suggests. We had to bring her to the Warrens' house at some point, and it became very apparent that Annabelle 3 was going to be about that story. Take your time. We'll be fine. Right, Judy? We cut to a year later. The Warrens are heading out of town, as they do to lecture, to investigate other cases. And they leave Judy, their daughter, at home with a babysitter. The events of our movie take place over the course of that one night when they leave. Don't your parents, like, keep any creepy stuff around? We keep it all locked away in a room. It's not good for anyone to go in there. So that's where we pick up, early 1970s. 
It's a year after the first conjuring. The thing with Ed and Lorraine, I wanted to think about them not just in terms of paranormal investigators, which they do so well in the conjuring movies. I wanted to really sort of dig into just to think about them as parents. Set. The opportunity to have Patrick and Vera back to play Ed and Lorraine was something that we leapt at, and they embraced it entirely. Having the Conjuring movies and the Annabelle movies sort of intersect and sort of cross over, it really helps kick off this movie in a great way. It's really more a story about their daughter, Judy, and, uh, and what she goes through. The parents are away, and now this doll is going to get up to all kinds of mischief and unlock all the spirits that are inside that haunted museum. What about the doll that's in there? Annabelle? Don't talk about her. She's in a case for a reason. We always love the idea of using the artifact room as the home base for a movie. We've shown the artifact room in all the other films, and we've hinted at the opportunity that lies there. My dad says that everything in there is either haunted, cursed, or used in some ritualistic practice. This movie will really allow us the opportunity to introduce other new artifacts, too, that we didn't uh, initially come across in the uh, earlier films. Here's the rest of the file if you uh, want to take a look. Ed and Lorraine, they have dozens of books. They have a ton of cases to explore, and this gives us an opportunity to get a glimpse into a couple of them. What's with the coins over their eyes? They used to put them over the eyes of the dead to pay the ferryman so he could take their souls to the underworld. We started with really hundreds of options, and then it's just a process of elimination. What are the things that excite us the most? <laughs> The most fun that I have on working on this film is just sort of spitballing ideas with Gary. You know, it's the third one in a series. We gotta have fun. We try to think what are the characters gonna be scared of, not necessarily what James and I are gonna be scared of. Although, James and I do scare easily, it turns out. Mom? Mary Ellen? Judy, is everything okay? What's going on? Something is happening inside your house, and I don't think it's safe to go outside. We're not really sure what to do. Can I speak to Annabelle? I'm sorry? You need to give her a soul. <laughs> Judy Warren is Ed and Lorraine Warren's daughter. But you know, at the end of the day, she's still just a kid. She's still gonna be scared. She's still gonna have her own fears and anxieties. And that's universal. Action. Go. We've always loved the idea of young protagonists. And we've had it in all the other films. Conjuring 1 had the Perrin kids. Conjuring 2 had the Hodgsons. Obviously, we had the orphans in Annabelle Creation. Uh, we had a baby in the first Annabelle. The idea of having a young protagonist has the audience leaning in from the get-go, worried about what's gonna happen to that person. I think that the intensity of it is only heightened because of their ages. It's based on a true story. Annabelle is real. She's sitting in an artifact room in Connecticut right now in a case that says, do not open. That's not just for the movie, that's a real thing. And I think that really freaks people out. You know, thank God for the Warrens. And the priest who comes and blesses her once a week. The uncertainty of the extent of the evil that can pass through her is something that keeps people on the edge of their seat. We want each movie to feel a part of the universe, but also a part from the universe in some way. So it doesn't feel like you're getting in Annabelle 3 what you got in Annabelle 2 or Annabelle 1. We're trying to tell this sort of really rich mythology. All the stories are different. The movie should be too. The first movie was a lot more intimate. It takes place in a little farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, whereas the second one, it takes place in a council housing in London. And I really do think the London setting just gives it a slightly different flavor. The people just have a different look to it, have a different smell to it. My name is Bill Wilkins, and I'm 72 years old. What do you make of that voice? He sounds confused. Is he seen out? The voice on this tape is coming from an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> this is one of the first cases for them. They have worked across faiths, across denominations, but I think this is one of the very first times that this was in a local case for them. We're staying at the Hodgson's house, is that uh, right? Always better to be in the mix. The Enfield case was a very natural successor to the original Conjuring film. It is certainly one of the best known examples and the most documented examples of paranormal activity, of supernatural possession. Get back to bed, the law are you! 
The reason we picked this particular case is because this is one of their most interesting ones. The Haunting of the Hudson family is a mirror reflection of the Amdeville story in that both cases um, are very well documented. And out of their repertoire of cases that they've investigated over their lifetime, this is one of their most interesting ones. Stay away from Billy! Leave us alone, you idiot! Shut up, what you doing? There's no one here! This is my house. For the family, when weird things started to happen, they actually did the right thing and they caught the cops. <laughs> and that's how the police were involved. They came to the house, they um, investigated, they checked around, and sure enough, um, all the weird stuff that the family were saying were happening in the home actually happened to the police officers. Is it something supernatural? Is it something from within a young 12-year-old girl going into her teenage years? Is it something that she's manifesting herself? <laughs> and the warrants basically try and determine if this case is real or if it's a hoax. And that's part of the fun with this one. You want to see them pull through it. Does it feel like the voice is coming from inside you? More well, like it's coming from behind me, like I'm being used. Janet, are you all right? Janet's asleep. And I'm talking. Does it ever say things just to you that only you can hear? What does it say? It said it wants to hurt you. I've done research all over the world, not just Connecticut, but all over the world. I never charged for anything I did, so we had to make our money with our paintings. What happened wasn't good. I needed to help them. We could be looking at hysterical neurosis. That would explain the multiple personalities and hallucinations. That doesn't feel right either. Lorraine has cited this particular case as being one of the most terrifying of her career, the epicenter of one of the most witnessed and the longest case of poltergeist activity. Maddie going up, Mars. Oh my God. The levitation of those girls. <laughs> they had a bed on this side and that side. Then they levitate, crisscross in the air. The true life aspect of it, the fact that Ed and Lorraine truly did this for so many years goes a long way because one wonders what you would do in the circumstances. It's very important in horror movies that you care about the characters. If you care about the characters, then the scares would play so much stronger. That's very important to the way I construct my scares. Because if you believe in the characters, if you really like who they are, I can put them into whatever situation and you would care about them. Damn it, Lorraine, I'm not doing it with you here. In the first movie, Patrick's character, Ed, was very nervous and was very protective of Vera throughout. And what I love about the second one is now it's flipped. It is Vera who's very afraid and protective of what would happen to Ed in this one. Yeah, this is the code word for our entrance. <laughs> They complement each other so beautiful as a couple. That has always been the way into these, these two, portraying their great love and partnership. Vera and I have some really beautiful moments. It's real, real story happened to them. Let's tell that story. Couple that with the relationships of this family trying to help people. That makes people get really invested. There was someone in here. I saw her with me on eyes. I did this to my girl. I've always harbored the desire and aspiration to want to make a love story. And so I guess I just kind of um, disguised it as a, as a horror movie to get that across. <laughs> we all had to work very hard to really live up to the bars that were set by the first one. That's kind of the things that you need to do as a filmmaker. So. James's imagination and that eloquence in the, in the poetry that I see is like an adult version of your childish nightmares. We know there are other stories to tell, but we've never felt the pressure 
to push them out there until we feel like there is a great story to tell and that we have something that, again, will be a worthy entrance to the Conjure universe. I'd like you all to sit quietly and close your eyes. Residents of Brookfield were shocked this afternoon by the first murder in the town's 193-year history. I think I heard someone. This is Ed Warren, here with Lorraine. All right, let's get started. I really wanted Conjuring 3 to get away from the haunted house setup of the first two Conjuring films. It should be more on a whole different level, something that we've never explored before in the Conjuring world. We wanted to keep our new story grounded in the feel of Conjuring movies, but we wanted to make sure we were telling a brand new story. And we think the Arne Johnson story was something that really deserved a much closer look. A trial of Arne Cheyenne Johnson. This was an internationally renowned case, which was the first time in the history of law in the United States that... Yeah. That demonic possession was used as a reason for committing manslaughter. I'm here to tell our story. There's not one day in my life that goes by that I never think about it. It's always there. It scars you. I met Arnie when I was working down in Bridgeport. When Arnie and I rented a home, my brother David, he started getting physically attacked. And where Arnie comes into play, Arnie witnessed what they assume was a demonic possession with David. David was suffering so bad, and we're all right there with him. Arnie couldn't take it anymore because he was trying to help my brother. Leave him alone! At his wit's end, he called out to Didi yeah. and invited him into his own. And when he had challenged the beast, he was possessed. You're in for a much different ride than you've been on in other Conjuring films. What's the point of a sequel if you can't outshine and outstory <laughs> and outheart the previous films? When I was working with Michael Sharves on La Llorona, I saw a filmmaker that really gets these kind of films. It's bittersweet for me to pass the baton on. And action! But it's good to get a fresh take on where we can take the Conjuring universe. We're offering something very special with these films, and I think that's one of the reasons people keep coming back. The final reason, of course, is that people love to be scared. I don't know that anybody has crafted or created better scare sequences than James Wan, David Sandberg, Gary Doberman, Corn Hardy, John Leonetti, Michael Shavs. Guys, we're making Conjuring 3. It's going to be awesome. These are all people that really know what they're doing, and they do an incredible job crafting new and original scare sequences. That's really what people come back to see. You're saving him worth everything you have. Lorraine! Because that's what it may very well cost. Lorraine!